What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and actually leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to help you to make workshops work. Today with me on the show, Nisa Yahoub, and we are talking about agile facilitation and the transformation it takes to get into conscious facilitation. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you just lean back, enjoy the show, and visit workshops.work to download my one-page summary. Stay tuned. Nisar, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for having me. Yes. We're going to talk about agile facilitation. Yeah, fantastic. A beautiful topic to spend our time with. Yeah. Absolutely. And before we jump into the topic, I would be curious to hear when did you saw or what happened first? Because you're a facilitator and an agile coach. So what came first? Did you first call yourself a facilitator or a coach? What's your story? Yeah. yeah, it's a very good question. I like it. So I started basically as more or less like a coach. So uh, people normally say that uh, I do have a good way of coaching people, that I'm able to empathize very easily, that I, when I do give advice, I do give advice that's very relevant and people can really relate to that. And I do it also in a very gentle way, right? So the, the way I'm coaching, is, it's, it's not like, hey, I'm directing you to go in a, in a specific way. So because of my coaching skills, yeah, I, I started becoming more like an agile coach in, initially. And uh, secondly, why facilitation is very important is that in an agile environment, what you see is that facilitation is needed because you need to guide some specific agile events. And for these specific events, you need proper facilitation skills. Mm. So I started developing these facilitation skills. And uh, yeah, later, uh, they, both, they, they actually go both uh, hand in hand. So if you're, if you're really good in coaching and really good in facilitation, you can start mixing them in order to help both the individual, but also uh, the team, right? Mm. So coaching is more initially directed to, towards uh, individual level and if you look at facilitation, it's more directed to, to the group. I was just thinking, when you say agile coach, is it that you coach an agile process or that you're agile in your coaching? <laughs> That's a funny question. <laughs> wow, I think both. I think both, mm -hmm. yeah. You are guiding people. You are helping people on an individual level and in a team level and an organizational level to help them uh, to become more mature and agile. Yet, on the other hand, you know, the way I'm coaching is also in an agile way that you really look at the person and look at the situation and see how things are. And if things are not working, you have to be also agile yourself, right? So, yeah, I would say like the way I would, I would see like I would actually coach is really like, hey, on the spot, you know, sometimes a joke will work better than telling someone like, hey, mm. you should not do it. You know? So, yeah. What do you understand by agile? That's a very good question. And <laughs> so... There's, a lot, of course, nowadays a lot uh, talk about Agile, right? So is Agile that someone say? Is Agile just using a specific framework or is Agile just something that comes and go? But in my view, what Agile really means is Agile is really a mindset. And mm -hmm. the mindset is very, very simple. You know, people overcomplicate it. But in, initially, there are two aspects which are very important. The first one is you would always try to make your work as small as possible. Mm -hmm. and try to do this within a, a container, right? Mm -hmm. And this container is also called an iteration or sprint, but nonetheless, it's, an, it's a container. And the second important aspect of Agile is you always build some time for reflection. Mm -hmm. So learning is very fundamental. So you always make a container or event or however you want to call it. You know, you always try to get feedback. That's also another one as quick as possible, whether that's on a people level, whether that's on a product level or a project level, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you can get so much learnings out. And if you try to incorporate that in your work process, that that's basically the, the whole concept of, mm -hmm. of Agile. 
Mm. And I hear two things. One is making work as small as possible, and I will come back to that in a second. And the other is this mentality and mindset of how to structure a sprint mm. to take breaks. And I can perfectly see how this would then translate into the facilitation space yes. where you actually plan your workshop for these reflection and feedback phases before moving to the next exercise. I love that. Now I can picture <laughs> what you mean by agile facilitation. But to come back to the making work as small as possible, what do you mean by that? So basically when you look at classical, classical ways of how we do project, it's, it's literally you're, you start planning, you know, you start making plans for maybe like a half year or a year, like, hey, these are the things that we're gonna uh, work on, this is the scope. And in Agile, in a very, very nutshell means you try to break everything into very small iterations, right? Mm -hmm. So you make it in a sprint. So what you do is you say like, okay, in two weeks time, what is the most important thing that I would like to deliver, complete, whatever you, whatever it is, right? So most people think also that Agile is only for projects or like IT or, uh, you know, very specific. It can be applied in my view, and uh, this might be a little bit uh, unconventional about anything, you know, just to give you a <laughs> sidestep. I saw that even children, like really on primary school, uh, you know, some people got inspired and they are using now to how to learn, you know, uh, in, uh, in, mm. a, in a two week uh, cycle and they make beautiful drawings and I'm going to uh, start my day with, with playing and they make drawings and then I go, I'm going to do some drawing uh, on paper and then do some art. And so, you know, and reflect so, on it. Yeah, reflect on it. Of course, it's it's yeah. beautiful. It's a beautiful mindset. So once again, it's a mindset. It's not like you know something that's rigid or that that you have to do in a very structured way. It really can be applied to anything. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's just a, a yeah. sidestep from what uh, what we were talking about. So there's a fundamental difference between classical way of thinking, meaning you would finish the whole thing, whatever that is at the end of the whole project or the delivery or whatever that is. So that might be a half year or a year or even longer. When you work in an agile way, you most often define the things that you want to learn as quick as possible. So you know which direction you're gonna go, or you want to build something to test something out very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, for example, have a product, a very simple product, and you can go direction A or B, you, you just develop that part that you can test in the first sprint because then you know which direction you're going to go. And mm. after that, you learn very quickly, right? So you do a, we call it a retrospective or we call, we call it a review where you show whatever you have done to your stakeholders. And then from that information, you would learn, right? So it isn't, it, it's, it's very much about in kind of an open space and honesty like, hey guys, this is what we are working on and please uh, give some feedback, right? So mm -hmm. there's also less judgment or this kind of a sense like, oh, we need to hide things and on the end of the project, we were going to show what we're going to deliver. So it's a really kind of a radical transparency that you're, that you're showing, right? And also being honest with anything that you're finding. Interesting. And then it basically takes away this anxiety of revealing the final product at the end and replaces it by small chunks of anxiety by being totally transparent. Yeah, exactly. So most often what you see is during the reviews that sometimes uh, customers already start joining, you know? So mm -hmm. when we develop a product, you will see that customers actually come and just give direct feedback like, hey, you're building basically an app for me and it would be wise, you know, to invite me and I can give you directly feedback, right? It makes so, so much sense, yeah. Yeah. So how would you translate or how do you use this agile mindset when you plan or design a workshop? Yeah, so there, that's the second element you're referring to. So the first element of agile and facilitation is really, yeah, you're using facilitation in the agile environment so that people are able to work in an agile way. And the way the second element is basically like, how can you, when you are facilitating, come with that kind of agile mindset? Mm -hmm. So you're taking it deeper, right? So it means you're starting to embody really the agile mindset on a deeper level, meaning during facilitation, you start even becoming in, a, in an agile way. So this is not mm -hmm. being written or somewhere. This is when you, you know, when you're really, really taking the agile mindset into you. So 
like I said also earlier, so if you are facilitating, for example, a retrospective, it's sometimes challenging for people to really look like, hey, what did we actually do? Or sometimes people are like, hey, uh, I'm a little bit scared sometimes to speak some things out, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you start using that kind of a mindset like, hey, how can I still make sure that people are being open and transparent and able to uh, share these thoughts during the Agile uh, events? And if you would take it even deeper, <laughs> you know, on the level uh, of a facilitator, during one of these Agile events, you can also really start looking in every second what's going on with, the, with everything that's around you. How's the group dynamics? What's happening at the moment? Is someone, for example, shy? Or do you sense there might be a conflict? Do you sense that people are not speaking out? And in that moment, you can, of course, if you have some facilitation toolkit, you can start playing around and mm -hmm. seeing like, hey, I'm foreseeing that this is not going into the direction and the outcome that I was expecting. So you're helping the team in an agile way, <laughs> mm -hmm. in a very deep agile way in facilitating the sessions uh, with that kind of a mindset and adjusting on the spot. What is your favorite, you refer to the toolkit. Yeah. What's your favorite tool to do that or your favorite exercise maybe? I really love one thing and the, the thing I love is silence. Mm. Silence as a container is the most powerful thing that I feel that you can use during facilitation. And you can use silence as a container for just, you know, settling people in. Let's start any event or meeting, whatever, and just take one minute just to settle in. That can also happen. But the more impactful silence can be is when you let people who need that kind of a container to do the cognitive load, you know, to process things and to see things and to embody that, that can be very, very uh, powerful for, yeah, minimizing any social dynamics, you know, because we always have like extroverted people who immediately start talking and try to dominate the whole conversation mm -hmm. or really push you with their agenda. And you want to balance things out because, because in the end, why are you facilitating, right? The question really is you're facilitating because you want the best possible outcome and the best possible outcome as you know is not based on one individual it's based mm -hmm. on the whole group so that is what we want right else why, why even the people who are there right they yeah. they are coming there because they want to work together and build on, on an idea that is better than just what they can figure out themselves so silence is very very important also for the more difficult topics like I gave you already an example, like what, what happens when people are not really seeing a problem, for example. Mm. So one of my experience basically was a team was not seeing something clearly and they were ignoring something. So what I did is I introduced a retrospective and I customized this retrospective. So what I did is the topic was silence and I gave everyone five minutes of complete attention and you can speak anything out mm -hmm. and the rest of the group will listen. After the five minutes, we will pass it to the next person. And again, five minutes, we will only listen to that person and be completely silent. And the powerful impact that silence has and attention, listening and letting everything out was extremely, mm -hmm. extremely fruitful for the whole team to bond afterward and get a really, really deep understanding why things are not working or working and who, what, what's, what, you know, we, 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 we normally don't take this time. And if you do this in this powerful way, you really start to see why people act in a certain way. What are their, their struggles? What are their thoughts? And why do they come up with certain solutions, right? Yeah. So, after this, it was really wonderful to see how the team energy just grew tremendously mm -hmm. <laughs> and they bonded after that. that. Yeah, yeah, it was really phenomenal. I think it's, yeah, it's the combination of having time and space to really articulate without pressure and the awareness that there won't be any discussion after your input. So you basically take the fear of judgment away 
because yes. they you just don't allow the space for it exactly so if you know this as a facility you probably you you know if you're listening to this you are as a facility know that already that a safe space is fundamental right mm -hmm. and we know that we have some tips and tricks and for, to do that but one of the things when it becomes very difficult is when you look at how can you create a non-judgmental environment. Yeah. These kind of things, you as a facilitator have to really think about these things. Mm -hmm. How do you create this container with some structure that helps people? Yeah. How many people were in this group? So for how long did you do this exercise? Because I think that there's a sweet spot and there's maybe also a, when it becomes too lengthy. Yeah, so that, and that's very uh, interesting. So when you see the, the group was basically uh, eight people, in my, uh, something like eight, seven or eight people. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental thing is that you would see literally the introverted people uh, who are most often ignored, mm -hmm. struggling with filling up their time. And after one or two minutes, they would say like, I have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. They literally speak up and say, I have nothing to say. And once again, as a facilitator, you, you know, keep strong, <laughs> you keep holding yeah. that space and let it go. And what happens? Let the silence be. Mm. Yeah. After, after 10, 20 seconds, you know what? Actually, <laughs> that problem that you mentioned, you know, I always refuse to believe and et cetera, et cetera. And the person starts speaking, mm. right? And again, and it was, and you could see that the introverted person starting also to realize that, hold on a second, I also realize this on the spot by just mm -hmm. speaking it out. And that grows also confidence in that person. Oh, wow. That's a real transformation then that goes on. I have a similar exercise that I do quite often is to let people speak for three minutes, mm. answering a question. And I learned that from Patrick Howden on episode one. And what I realized is that usually... Filling up the one or two minutes is quite easy for almost everyone. Mm. And then as you described, there's this moment of silence. And then it goes deep. Yes. And even sometimes, I think in every group that I have done that, there's at least one individual who decides not to speak. And mm. then for the group to sit for three minutes with complete silence. Mm is so strong yes. because you start seeing this person even without words and for this person to realize that they can take up space without speaking and that's okay that's extremely yeah encouraging and powerful yes so you see here that the the two dimensions of coaching and facilitation mm -hmm. it's all meant for one purpose transformation right so mm -hmm. this is this is the fundamental thing and the the core thing what you what you mentioned is that you know you want to create an environment where people are all equal mm -hmm. so the first one is non judgmental but the second one is uh, you know you want everyone to be literally equal and some people because of their self-image or whether they are introvert or extrovert or personality they even project mm. during the facilitation or whatever events or the team in the team groups their role right so what you want to do is neutralize mm. that kind of a role that they have and with these kind of a little techniques you can customize really really deep facilitation sessions how would you design for a session where you have big differences in hierarchy, for instance, mm. and you know that for the group, it would be best to flatten the room in order to yes. come to an output that everyone can work with afterwards? Yes. What is your approach? <laughs> Coaching or facilitation yeah. or transformation or magic yeah, approach? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's a really cool question. I really like it. Yeah. So uh, one thing that straightway pops up is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So it means that you need to start embodying this in the whole group, mm -hmm. including the let's let's call it for the for the sake of uh, uh, for the exa example the manager, right? Mm -hmm. So a manager and a team, and they are all having a session. 
it means you really have to ask some really vulnerable questions like that everyone can open up you know it can of course it's not like straight away you go like hey tell me your <laughs> deepest secret you know straight away. <laughs> that's, you know you have to ask that's why you're a facilitator right so you have to see how do you uh, time these things when do you build this up so you start with first hey how about what, you know, like when, when you are at home on a Sunday and you don't have much time to, you know, you don't have a lot of things to do, what kind of a dish would you like to cook? You start with the very simple things. All right. Okay. Oh, nice. All right. So, okay. So then you start asking more questions like, okay, what is the thing that last week you were the most proud of? And what is it that you were not proud of? Mm. So you go already a little bit deeper, right? Mm-hmm. So, and then you can go to more you know, like more powerful questions like, yeah, like, for example, if you look back in the last period, is there something that you feel that you should have done, but you didn't do? Or mm. I felt very uh, shame, shameful about things. Mm. Yeah. So then you take the whole group onto a very different level yeah. and they are all balanced because basically what we're talking here about is we are all human beings. Yes. Right? yes. Yes. So, and it's not about I'm a manager or I'm the team member and, you know, and I should listen to you or you're taking that role. You're always the team lead. So I'm not going to speak and all these kind of things. You really want to go to that level that people are equal. And then you can start working on a kind of a space that is built on trust, equality, and, and this kind of a vulnerability because from that space, you can have real conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, you give them permission to show their humanness. Yeah. And thereby, you take away the roles and you flatten the room. Yeah. And I love the questions that you just gave as example. And I wonder how you would design this conversation. Would it be in a go-round style that you ask a question and everyone shares to the group? Or would you split them up in maybe pairs or, or triads to answer the questions in smaller groups? Yeah, so this depends on which context you are looking Mm -hmm. at, right? So basically in a business context, what I normally do is I do ask questions and I let them choose who's next sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that will also, you know, even your own role, you try to eliminate as much as possible. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you don't want to have people looking at you like, oh, who's next, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So when I would give you the question, I would say, Miriam, Okay, what do you think about this? And then after it's please pass it on and then you can pass it on back to me. And then you say like, Nizak. Okay, so that is one thing. Yet, I wouldn't say you should do this kind of thing straight away on a one-on-one level unless you're asking very, very deep questions. And then we speak more on, on, on more like a coaching session or, mm-hmm. or more sessions that has more to do with leadership work. So one of the things I've been doing also is giving workshops on conscious leadership mm-hmm. and in these environments where people are really, really want to go deeper and inside themselves. What I do is, uh, yes, I ask these questions then on a pair basis. So people mm-hmm. will pair. And, yeah. and, and, and cause that means, cause you are also a facilitator. You also have to guarantee the safety, right? So yeah. if you, <laughs> you know, yeah. if you, let's say you, you're starting a whole new year, you know, with uh, 50 uh, people and, uh, and you ask questions like, hey, I don't know, like this, what's the worst thing that ever happened with the company? <laughs> you know, <and> people, <laughs> you know, that, that's, you know, you have to guarantee also the safety of, so yeah. it's like, hey, you know, on one-on-one, it's, uh, you know, like a pair, it, it, those questions can really open up. Yeah, I can see that. What makes a workshop fail? So uh, there's many things that can make a workshop fail. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I have been lately to one of the one of the workshops. I won't mention anything about it yet. It, in my view, it was really painful to be there. Actually, mm. for you and as a facilitator or for the participants? I was as a participant there, oh. so I wasn't there as a facilitator yet. Of course, my facilitation radar was on and see what was <laughs> going on. So uh, first of all, it it really has to do: are the right people there? Right. Mm-hmm. So are the right people there? And are you prepared? You know, it's these basic things. And then I, when I start looking deeper into this, are, are there, the, uh, you know, is the right energy there? Is the right mm-hmm. intentions there? So yeah. what I saw so far is that 
Yeah, you know why it wasn't working out? Because the whole thing was really about an, a topic about artificial intelligence and it was very fascinating about, uh, you know, to talk about these things and how it can help society and businesses. Yet, there were no people from, uh, how you say this, more expertise there. Mm-hmm. There were people more from a marketing and a sales perspective there. Mm-hmm. The account managers were there. And I became like, okay, wow, wh- what is this, right? So if your intentions aren't right, it doesn't matter because this is just an example I'm giving. Mm-hmm. It, it's really, really challenging for the facilitator. And it can, if there's no facilitator, there's a guarantee it can almost, it, there's almost 100%, let's call it like that. <laughs> it's almost 100% guarantee it's going to fail. If you're meeting this or the ses- session or retrospective or planning or whatever event you're holding, and you really want to look a- in the future and, and determine your next plan for your company, your department, or your team, and one of the person is really there because he's really annoyed and frustrated and he wants to, and literally just want to, you know, uh, shout out and do whatever he wants and hijack the whole group dynamics. It, th- that's what we are talking about. So it's, it's really mm-hmm. challenging. So as a facilitator, once again, I'm saying you really have to look at the group and see if even their intentions, you know, are aligned with the group purpose. Mm-hmm. So that's why the preparation, that's why all, you know, if you look at all these facilitation techniques, they all start with, hey, make sure that you are prepared. Make sure that the teams or uh, people know what you're going to do in this session, right? And they have to consent with this or, you know, in a way, they have to agree with this. You have to say like, no, I I really want to do that. And this is also indirectly referring back to the intention that people have. Mm. I love your example about um, having a session about AI and then there's a, you sense that some people are missing in the room Mm. and you refer to the right people. Mm. So how do you know who are the right people? Yeah, so it's a, oh wow, that's a difficult question. (laughs) So of course, if you're facilitating and you are in that and you know, hey, this, then, you know, you're too late then, you know, if you're already there. So obviously, (laughs) it's obviously too late. Uh, So, uh, so this comes back when you get the work, right? So when you, most often what, uh, as a facilitator or as a coach, whatever you want, you you are in, you will get a request like, hey, can Mm -hmm. you help us out? I need your help in, in that case you do an intake and the intake is very simple you just sit with a person and say like hey what's your goal what do you try to do you know who are the people and then you can already start sensing like hey okay no okay these are the people who really need to be there and you're not and sometimes you can ask also a little bit provocative questions like okay with this amount of people and these roles can you make basically at the end of the session a decision that can impact the whole company or mm. can impact the whole, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, the, the whole department. If you ask this question and people, because at the end you want to make them aware of the situation, yeah. right? So this is where the coaching and the facilitation also comes, you know, uh, mixed. And then when the person said, oh no, we really need to invite that person, that person, okay, great. Because then you can make it more effective. You know? mm. So you start with the end in mind. How does the decision look like that we want to take and that it's implemented and then audit for the implementation and the decision making, who needs to be there to achieve that? Absolutely. Always start with the end in mind because yeah. uh, we, are, as a facilitator, you really look at the outcome, right? So, yeah. what is it that you want to achieve and focus on that? And from there, you try to build back basically yeah. with, some, with some alternatives. Yeah. Interesting. I, I'm coming back to the workshop that you mentioned that you visited as a participant. Which is a different setting, right? Because if I got it correctly, mm-hmm. it was more, it sounds more like a meetup. Okay, let's talk and learn about AI. Yeah. And then you realize, okay, there are only marketing people in, in there. Right. Assuming that you were to, to host such a meetup, mm-hmm. what would be your approach then to make sure that the right people are in the room? Yeah. What is the output or outcome that you want to achieve and how to backward? Engineer. Yeah, so so basically, that's that's not uh, it's a, it's it's basically quite simple. So basically, you would really look once again to the end of end in mind, you know. So what's the outcome? So you want to have a, a fruitful discussion. You want to bring people together. That's the outcome, uh, literally, and share some knowledge. So from that perspective, you would you would build things back, right? So you would then see like, okay, 
it means you need some technical people, you need some people from the business, you need people from this, you know, like all these kind of things. You would start uh, breaking these kind of things down. Then you would start seeing like, hey, can you get these people there? And then, then of course, you start talking, thinking about how would you facilitate this, mm-hmm. you know, all these all these people. And then you can start with with some uh, simple questions, some powerful questions like, hey, what, what's what's it artificial intelligence for you? What does it mean? Um, uh, how can it benefit people? You know, you start with these kind of things, and then after you start with with such things uh, concretely, it will reveal itself, right? Yeah. Do you ever feel you're tired of the trip from home to the home office? Do the physical confines of your house are not getting you the exposure to the new ideas that you need? Maybe you need Mastermind. At Mastermind, you work together with a group of peers who help you bring new perspectives to your challenges, to find new solutions, and who you can even give a little bit back to by helping them solve their problems. In a compressed two hours, you'll get a day's worth of learning. So why don't you get out of that box and come to Mastermind? Workshops.work slash mastermind. You mentioned before that you also did workshops and I was uh, fortunate to be part of one. um, Yeah. Conscious (laughs) leadership, about conscious leadership. Right. So first, maybe you you can share with the audience what you understand by conscious leadership, Hmm. and then you can share how this approach actually helps you in your facilitation practice. Yeah. So, so basically classical leadership, uh, you know, or, or, or I would say like the classical way of management is basically more on the, on the outer side, you know, so you focus on how do you prioritize? How do you deliver? How do you delegate? How do you really control the work and the projects and the people. And you, you see more or less than the new kind of leadership coming more into the perspective like, hey, how do we really nurture people? How do we really make them grow? And of course, here comes also a, a new perspective is how do we really facilitate you know, uh, people? Especially in the agile world, a lot of managers really need to start moving from a kind of a controlling way of looking mm-hmm. at the organization towards more yeah facilitating so of course you can go and read a book like you know 10 rules for <laughs> 10 rules for uh, facilitation and stuff like that and you know you can try these kind of things out and i think you will be effective but you will be far more effective if you start going also deeper inside yourself and really look at the way you are putting energy it comes back now <laughs> energy mm-hmm. into the session you know so it's, it's really, so conscious leadership is really about looking inside how, what are you thinking, right? How are your emotions and, and what kind of intentions are you putting out, right? Mm. So you know, conscious leadership really, really helps me and I'll come back to, to, to your question, like how, what does it mean for, for, for me? Is that during sessions, it's very easy to try to steer the group into a certain way because you believe that's the right choice. Mm-hmm. Or it's a better choice. And as a coach, it, it sometimes can become difficult because you really want people to really understand that, hey, certain things are needed based on your experience in an, in an agile way or in a way that you have seen it in other companies. And to really be, become aware that as a facilitator, you do have this kind of a bias. Mm-hmm. And the more you start working on this, you, can't, you, you start seeing far easier what you're projecting out. So if you are fearful, (laughs) you will project this out as a facilitator, right? And that makes the groups Mm -hmm. also also nervous. Mm -hmm. So if you are more happy, people become also more happy. So all these kind of things will impact. And uh, as uh, the, uh, yeah, if you work more in a, in a sense on uh, looking more into this dimension, you know, looking really like, well, yeah, what's going on inside of me? That is, that's what I call conscious leadership. So the self-consciousness that then translates into your leadership skills. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, basically, the deepest way I can describe leadership is that leadership for me means everything that starts as the most purest and authentic way from inside of you. Mm-hmm. So this can be anything that comes from that dimension. Because whether you are thinking about something, whether it's facilitating something, whether it is doing your work, 
it all comes from from inside of you right mm -hmm. so it, uh, so if you are sometimes struggling with things or you're confused or you feel like oh I, oh man I, I don't i really don't have time for to do that i'm, I'm getting mm -hmm. annoyed or stuff stuff like that you know if you start really working on this and become aware of that that means really you are creating more consciousness basically and from that space you are more easy able to act in a more conscious way so of course this is a very broad topic to dive into literally it means let's say in during the let, let me give an example maybe that will clarify it let's say you're in a in a session mm -hmm. and one of the person is chewing on something and it annoys the living hell out of you <laughs> <laughs> i love your example <laughs> Right. The little triggers. So, so as a facilitator, you can start becoming a little bit moody because of this, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, you, you know, you start like, mm. so, okay, so who's next? What's going on? And here is the difference, right? You start reacting. You start really <laughs> reacting and you might even maybe unconsciously start not seeing the person anymore. So you might get, not give him the turn or, or hurt, hurt the turn or something like that or not even looking at the person anymore. Mm -hmm. So, no, seriously. And this yeah. will impact the whole group that dynamic. And maybe you are right that, it, that, that the whole group might sense something about it, right? Yet, the core thing about being conscious about this, and this is why I'm bringing up this example, and conscious leadership is focusing really about what's going on inside of you. The difference is here between reacting out things and taking responsibility mm. so you can respond so that means hey i'm sensing that i'm becoming annoyed by someone doing all right acknowledge it right second thing is there something you can do about it maybe you can you know it's not always you can't you know so mm -hmm. sometimes you can say like hey how about we have a break and you know have some lunch is there you know is this something <laughs> something we all need you know who knows <laughs> this can happen and maybe the whole group will support you in that right yeah. but the core thing is here not to start reacting and showing your back at the, at the person or not looking at the person yeah and also being conscious that this behavior of this person is nothing about the person but about yourself so yes. there's something that triggers you and i yes. and i can only speak for myself but if I get annoyed in these situations, it's usually because I'm already nervous or anxious or stressed mm. in the first place. So Beautiful. if I'm in a good place, if I feel like being in control of what's going on, then anything can happen and people can chew and fart as much as they want. <laughs> um, nothing will get me out of or will trigger me. But if I'm maybe nervous because i have the impression that we won't achieve the goal on time or if i have something else on the back of my mind these small things they will get me out of out of my balance yeah right so basically you start judging basically you are you are exactly. being, being yeah. the biggest judge yeah. you know the, the 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 most important element then is uh, yourself you know you are the one who's blocking the whole outcome of the group you know if you look from on a deeper level you are doing that you know because you're Absolutely. basically if there's a time pressure and you're feeling like uh, nervous or something like that and you start projecting this out you know the whole group is going to sense this you know you're start you, you really start slowing things down and the the important aspect here is when you really start seeing this on a deep level mm. you start seeing that you need to open up basically yeah. and this is the this is a very challenging thing about facilitators we don't like to talk about it a lot mm. <laughs> there's a part of about preparation and mm. there's a part also of letting things go yeah and that letting things go can be scary because it means that you have to sometimes let go of your structure right because mm -hmm. maybe you have prepared something to go in a very very you know in a structured way and going into this and then that and that and this happens and then at the end we will have a good decision and then the group will, would be happy but sometimes it's more important to let the group go in a certain way where they want to go and maybe they won't won't come to that kind of decision yeah. right but the understanding would be more important and now we come back again to this kind of an agile facilitation right I was thinking exactly <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's also letting go, right? So agile facilitation is is about also letting go. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, when you see that things are like 
hey, maybe I should try something out because else it would, would go in a different direction. And then you step up, right? So it's, a, it's kind of a paradox because sometimes you want to let the group go into a, a different direction. But sometimes you see that, hey, I don't think it's, it's, it's right. It's going into a di different way. And that can be like a conflict might arise or something mm -hmm. like that. Quite obvious, of course. And then you steer up. But th mm -hmm. this, is, this is really the, the difficult part of being a facilitator. And I think a lot of people know this deep down that when do you step in and when do you let the group uh, go? That is such an important aspect. I mean, group dynamics are tricky, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ingewickelt, you would say in Dutch. <laughs> so sometimes a group goes into a direction because they want to avoid the pain. So there is a topic that needs to be addressed that is big. And in order to avoid that, the group will just get into the nitty gritty details and make a huge fuss out of it just because it feels more comfortable. And other times they go into a different direction because there's actually something deeper that they need to explore that hasn't been expressed yet. So from what I hear from you is that as a facilitator, you really have to sense whether this off-track conversation, is it a way to avoid mm. or is it a way to dig deeper? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Talking about agile, talking about conscious leadership. And at one point I even had the label conscious facilitation in my <laughs> mind. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, for you, what would be the future of facilitation? We're talking about the future of work. What is the future yeah. of facilitation? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a question I've been uh, thinking also about lately. And I've been also talking a lot with the facilitators and, 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 and agile coaches about it. So what you see happening, and this, this happens because the, the mindset of people are changing rapidly, so they will know that facilitation is a core thing, right? So facilitation becomes a skill that everyone, everyone will have. And then the question is, how do you facilitate facilitators? Mm. Right? And I do have some experience with, with it. <laughs> and most often, it, you know, because we all know what facilitation means. We all start talking about the process, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the future of facilitation is really about how can we, as a group, embed the facilitator role constantly during any session. Mm. So it isn't about one person being the facilitator. The whole group is facilitating. And to really start thinking about these kind of structures, whatever it is, or guidelines or frameworks or whatever, that would be really something interesting, right? Because what I would foresee is really that facilitation becomes a skill and that we will have multiple facilitators. Yet, how do we guide that kind of a dynamic? And that would be very interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. Two things come to my mind. One is... What if in an MBA curriculum, you would have the class facilitation <laughs> <laughs> so that every future manager or aspiring manager has to learn what facilitation means and how yeah. to facilitate? And the other thing is maybe even broader, what if anyone is conscious about facilitation so that in a meeting dynamic, really everyone could step up as a facilitator. What do you think would it take to have a team meeting, any team meeting where you have a manager in the different roles? What would change and what does it take if everyone had at least the awareness of facilitation? That's a beautiful question. I almost become uh, talking in a, in a Zen kind of a <laughs> way, right? you would have literally like a flow. You would have like a group, flow, right? So you, you would have a team starting in with a check-in, very natural. Oh, do you have a check-in? Yeah, I will have a check-in. All right, great. You start a session. So I'm trying to imagine it. So that, that's mm -hmm. the way I, I work. So you would see like, okay, the whole group starting. All right, that's a really good check-in. They are all energized. How do we all feel? Is this enough? Right, okay, no, great. Someone picks it up. And the moment things are 
moving out of hand. People might say like, hey, I, I think it's this is taking much a, a lot of time. Is this still relevant? You know, also with all the, all the awareness that every person will have and the skills, you know. So it would it would become much more in a flow, meaning you would have a, such a kind of a, um, effective session. It would be almost like an artwork, right? Mm-hmm. It would be it, it would be people come together. There's a lot of creativity happening, and anything that needs to, and this comes more from a deeper perspective, like anything that needs to happen during that kind of a session meeting, retrospective, whatever you're holding, will come up. So mm-hmm. nothing will be left out. I think that would be beautiful. Uh, that would be a beautiful way of describing it. Not nothing. Uh, will be left out that needed to be said because mm-hmm. most often during meetings there will be things that you feel like ah, I don't I feel this was ah. but in that sense nothing will be left out in a beautiful artistic way or an artful way and that's better yeah I like this vision because yeah you're totally right very often after meeting there's kind of a post meeting that happens mm. in the corridors or <laughs> in the loo or something where people then yeah. start basically debriefing and speaking out everything that hasn't been said. Yes. That would be a check to see if it was really in in that kind of a flow. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, great. I have the impression that we went from agile coaching to agile facilitation to conscious facilitation to the future of facilitation. Maybe the future of facilitation is conscious facilitation. (laughs) Yeah, who knows? Or conscious leadership. (laughs) Yeah, who knows? (laughs) Is there anything in our conversation that you have the impression we haven't talked about? No, I I I I think this was uh, this was right. I I would like to say, as a facilitator, as a tip, as a guide, uh, always go deeper. Mm. Would this be your hashtag? Yeah, that would be my hashtag. (laughs) Go deeper. (laughs) Yes. Wonderful. If someone fell asleep after minute one, just woke up and doesn't have time to listen to the entire show again, wow. what would be your, your message to this person? Uh, replay and start listening again. Wonderful. <laughs> 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 Thank you for your time, Nisa. Sure. I will Pleasure. put everything and how to get in touch with you, work with you, continue the conversation with you in the show notes so that people can reach out. Perfect. Go deeper. Thank you. Yeah, go deeper. Let's go all deeper. (laughs) Wonderful. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, Please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.